My name is Phil Fearon and today I'm introducing the XSLT extension for Visual Studio Code that I've developed and am now maintaining. So uh, we first of all find the extension by from our extensions panel on Visual Studio Code just typing in XSLT and we should see it listed here. I've already got this installed. Uh, if not you would need to click the install button and in fact after installing it helps to restart Visual Studio Code uh, for the XSLT tasks that we're going to go on to next. So when running XSLT we use the Saxonica XSLT processor and we can either use the JavaScript or the Java XSLT processor. But for today's demonstration I'm going to use uh, Saxon JS, which is the JavaScript version. So if we go to the documentation for that uh, and we scroll down here, this describes some of the details about how tasks are run, but we'll just skip that and get to the bit that talks about how we configure a Saxon JS for this instru uh, for this processor. So we effectively use this npm install instruction from uh, within a project folder. So the first thing to do is to ensure that we've got um, a folder ready. So I've created an empty folder which I'm just going to open now, which is demo1. So once we have this project folder uh, we're in the terminal, so we're actually inside the demo1 uh, folder path. So now we can do, just initialize this for npm first of all. So minus yes just ensures that we just have a default package.json file. So now I can uh, run that command that I copied from the documentation and Save dev, that flag just means that we're going to install it as a developer dependency. So let's install that. Okay, so we now have the Saxon JS processor installed for this project. So the next step is just to create uh, an XSL file and a data file. So let's uh, create a couple of folders first of all. Let's create a um, source folder and now let's also create a data folder and inside the data folder let's create a file and we'll call this colors uh, colors.xml and let's keep this very basic so now the XSLT extension is providing some uh, kind of snippets that are built in but uh, for this very simple uh, data file we don't really need to use those so I'm not going to go through them at the moment so, so, uh, so that can be our colors so now we're uh, this is saved and now we need to go to a source and create XSLT file so and let's call this um, demo.xsl. So it's important to give it an XSL extension. So now we have that, uh, we can just again rely on built in snippets from the extension to create a, a default style sheet. So that's our default. Um, but we can get rid of uh, some of the parts that we don't need so let's uh, remove some of the namespace declarations and we'll create an HTML uh, file and yeah it's okay to have an in indented we're using a built-in uh, templates for actually uh, doing a shallow copy uh, but here we're going to be matching on the root element. So we now it's probably going to help to have these alongside each other just for the purposes of. So 
our root element is colors and so within for each color we want to um, output a, a paragraph say so the first thing is that we're going to have a HTML kind of root element so we we can use a built-in snippet for this so we can say it's going to be a little element and this is going to be HTML and then we can have a body another little element and so within our body we can apply templates so this is using autocomplete for this so it's effectively only gives us the uh, permitted kind of instructions for the context so because we're in a template we can apply templates within here and we can apply templates to all child elements so now we just need to create a template that is going to match those child elements and so they've all got different names so we can just give the default kind of any element for this and we're going to create a paragraph element um, so this is a literal element we could have actually used a built-in snippet for that so let's do that I suppose so we've got a P and then we can put use a literal at attribute here and let's Ah, that's interesting so yeah the autocomplete doesn't quite work that well with the literal um, attribute so I'll ignore that for the time being and go back up here and just uh, do this basically so we're going to have a style style attribute and let's uh, use a style according to what the name of the, the element is so um, we effectively want to we can use an attribute value template for this so let's do that and now we want to use the xpath function to get the name for that element so we've got that now and perhaps for the content of this element we can um, have the name of the color also so let's do a we've got expand text set here so we can actually use a text value template here also so let's um, use the same function here so that should create uh, what it is that we want to achieve the chances are that there are errors there but we can go back to them once we've got this running so I want to show now how we actually run the XSLT so it's as I mentioned it's using this built-in Saxon ta uh, built-in Visual Studio Code tasks so if I type shift command B to bring up uh, the default um, tasks it says no build tasks to run found so it's giving us the option to configure build tasks so I can select that and then at the bottom here we have these two um, kind of built-in task templates so I'm going to use xslt.js and so it's created a new tasks.json file with um, some built-in data but we, we need to change this now just to suit our project so let's call this as the label demo one and we that's the node modules folder which is fine um, what we want to do is set what the file is going to be so it's inside the workspace folder so we can copy this to here and also the source is going to be inside the workspace folder and so we've set up the XSLT file to be source demo dot XSL and the XML source is going to be inside data 
colors.xml. Now the other thing to note is that this has been set up as the, the default because of the way that we've um, created this task. Uh, it doesn't have to be the case. You can have any number of uh, tasks and in a more sophisticated project you probably would have. So you would just set uh, that default to uh, false if you wanted to be able to switch between different XSLT tasks. So we can demonstrate that a bit later on. So let's, um, now we've got that set up, we can go back um, to our demo file and shift command B again, but this time this, it should pick up this new default task that we've created. Let's see if we've created that correctly. Uh, it appears to have worked because we've now got this XSLT out directory here and we've got this result1.xml. And so what's happened is um, Saxon has picked up on the fact that we're generating HTML. So it's actually uh, set the output type to be HTML, which is quite useful. So it's added the, the doc type for us. And uh, that should be it. We can... Um, now, it would be probably more useful to have that named as... Um, uh, with an HTML extension, so we can open that up in the browser. So let's go ahead and uh, uh, change our task to set the result file to be .html. And let's remove result that result because we don't um, need that. So um, we can run this again, shift command B, and it's telling us here it's created result1.html. So let's have a look. Uh, so now because we've got the HTML extension, it's using Visual Studio Code's kind of built-in HTML functionality, so it's actually showing us the colors that we've set up. So we can also just have a look at our result in the browser. And we've got effectively what we were aiming to get. So that is the, the basics of uh, what this extension is uh, able to provide. So you're able to uh, invoke the Saxon JS processor from within Visual Studio Code using a standard build task. Uh, this tasks file, it can include parameters, so perhaps I should demonstrate that by... Um, uh, if we should get some autocomplete here, so let's just see what we um, can actually add here. So we're going to add parameters here, and that takes an array so if we hover over this, it uh, doesn't actually give us some, see if we get some autocomplete going on here. So it's going to take an object and within that object, I'd again rely on autocomplete, it's going to take a name and a value property. So let's have a name and this can be, um, we'll just call it value uh, one and we need a value also which we can call fill. Say. So that will apply that parameter so that it's available within here. So within here now we need to add a, a param instruction it's going to be val1 and and it's a string and we don't need a default value because we're going to expect 
that to be passed in. So it's showing this faintly, the VAL1 name, because we're not actually using that yet. So let's um, uh, add this. This is really um, quite artificial, but it's just to demonstrate uh, how you might um, use parameters. So uh, we'll use an attribute value template and just uh, so you'll see there's only one parameter or variable available in this context and so it's giving us val1 as that value so we can accept that and you can see now that val1 is highlighted normally because it's actually being used it's no longer being shown shown faintly so we, we're adding this id that should have a value now of fill because that's what we've passed in we've got that um, set up in our tasks.json file so now let's run this again. Uh, Shift Command B, and there we have fill being added. Um, okay, show you some other features. Perhaps one useful thing to do would be to actually, if we open up the extension again, it lists the set of features that are available, and we can go through some of these. So syntax highlighting, well, you've already seen that um, there's full syntax hi highlighting for XSLT3 and also that there's special highlighting for variables when they're um, not being used. So we have built-in code diagnostics. So, for example, if um, I have this change this value, so so that parameter is no longer available in any context. So the val1 that we're um, trying to use, that hasn't been declared anymore. So we get a problem reported here, and that will be listed in the problems list here. And uh, at any time, you can go to a problem just by clicking on the problems list and it will scroll to the, the right location. So that's problem reporting and that covers all the different symbol types. Uh, so we've got auto completion you've seen, syntax highlighting and themes. So this has been designed to be compatible with uh, a large set of themes. I'm not going to say that it's compatible with all uh, Visual Studio Code themes to the full extent, but uh, we can, um, let's just um, switch themes to perhaps use a dark theme, so uh, let's go to the default uh, dark plus theme, which uh, I actually prefer, so we perhaps will stay with that for a bit. Um, the, the colors tend to show up a bit better with dark themes. So we've got um, code folding we get, but that's we're effectively relying on the formatting for that. So um, just to show how the formatting works. So this is sense. This is built into the XSLT extension, so it will format your code uh, according to what settings you have. So the recommendations are uh, to actually use uh, formatting as you type and also format on save. So if you don't enable formatting, there are some other features that um, you will not um, be able to use. So it's recommending that you do make use of formatting. So let's just um, uh, mess up the formatting a bit to um, show, so if I type shift option F that should invoke the formatter kind of manually and it has done. So the other thing, so I'll save that, but perhaps if we go back to where our, so I've just done a command Z to get back to bad formatting. If I type command S now, um, it automatically invokes the formatter just before it saves. So you can ensure that your 
formatting is always good. Uh, now the formatter works both at the XML level with the indentation but it will also work for um, XPath expressions so when you have um, nested expressions and so on it will um, format those properly also. Um, and so because of the formatting being done properly it means we can rely on code folding like that. Uh, snippets, well you've seen uh, examples of snippets when I've been typing but let's have a look in a bit more detail at this. So perhaps here um, if for example we have a look and we want to do a choose instruction so we type choose here. So then from within here we will only be given what is available within a choose instruction and it's only when and other, otherwise. So let's choose when and because uh, when requires a test attribute we're actually prompted for that here so we can just put in uh, some uh, dummy value here. So and within this when instruction we again if I type the angle bracket then I'll get what is available and so if I just want to see the XSL instructions and not the literal element instructions then we can just so this is effectively what is available and so for each one of these uh, you will get snippets that are made available according to not only what that instruction is but also what attributes are permitted on that instruction so if we do a uh, say perform sort then that takes a select attribute so it will put that on automatically and some of these snippets will be shown kind of self closed and others will um, be shown where you're, you've got a start tag and an end tag where it's expecting content if you don't quite get what you want uh, you can just um, for example if we wanted to um, remove that select attribute and make the whole perform sort instruction uh, self-closing. It doesn't actually make any sense in this context but let's do it anyway. Um, that hasn't quite worked as I expected so I think that's because um, I'm not quite sure to be honest. Let's um, if we if we have it like that so there's no attribute and then we type in this uh, forward slash it removes the end tag for us so that helps with um, just making coding a bit um, more effective so uh, we have a code symbol outline so I better demo that so if we go to the normal file view here we have an outline view that shows our XSLT file. Now one thing you'll find is that it tends to default to showing symbols in a kind of prioritized way but it's not by the order in which they they are and for XSLT development you normally want to sort by position so let's do that and so effectively the order here is the same as the order you see here. The other thing that's quite useful to to do is to have it so that it follows the cursor so when I'm, when I'm within the on that template you get to see where we are here so that's just in another useful way of navigating XSLT files especially when they get quite large um, further thing on uh, symbols because this is effectively showing the symbol structure so the other part is, is if I do shift command O it brings up a, a quick search method for looking for all the symbols that we have so we can see our literal elements declarations and also the instructions but it's quite useful also for picking out uh, things like uh, parameters so if I just type something like that then we would see a list of all the parameters that were declared um, so that is quite a useful way of navigating through your large XSLT files also and also 
with the symbol structure that we have, we also see in the breadcrumbs above that we um, we see exactly where we are within the template. So it shows here that we're within the body element and we, we can see what the parent symbols are and we can actually click on those to help navigate um, to other parts of the document. So if I can select output then it will take me to the output part. So that can be useful also. Let's go down through this. So we've got um, go to symbol as well. Um, so that's actually just what I was describing there and along with the symbol actually go to symbol if we look at that um, when you execute a go to references search or a peak definition we embed the result in line uh, I'm not sure that's quite what I wanted to demonstrate so perhaps we should skip that um, so but there is good symbol um, navigation basically that we have there and we've got a go to definition part so in order to demonstrate that perhaps I should create a function um, so with XSLT we need um, to create a namespace for functions so let's do that here so I can use the it's here we're being given some built-in uh, prefixes that we we might want to use but in fact it's none of those uh, prefixes so let's just um, put in our own so I'll just call it FN and we can give it any name we like So now we've got a um, namespace for functions. We can create a function and we can call it, say, let's just call it test and say, uh, got defeated by the autocomplete there. And now we can say that that's returning a string and we can take a parameter here and let's just call it, um, let's give it a new name, we'll call it val2 and that will also be a string and we can uh, return from this function uh, oh, we're calling that val1 actually so let's see what happens actually when we um, use val1 just it, this is a good way of showing how the kind of hierarchy of parameters works so so it shows here that we're using that value of val1 because that's kind of like the the nearest context but there's also that global val1 and the reason that's being shown is because this it's being used here so just to show if I were to change this so that we weren't using that particular uh, variable so if I remove that then we should actually see val1 uh, not being highlighted but it hasn't actually updated that for some reason. Ah, uh, that's because we're also using it there. So let's remove the dependency on val1 there also. And now we, we see that that isn't being used and we're also getting errors saying that um, we're not using, uh, we're using a variable that hasn't been declared. So perhaps the way to fix that now is to uh, change that to be val. And now we've got no problems being reported there. Um, but we have actually got a value, um, we got an issue here for the function name because we created that um, namespace but we're not actually using that yet. So it's objecting to that. So let's um, put
put in um, the namespace and it's accepting that now so should say that um, all of this kind of initial problem reporting that we get is coming from the kind of syntax analysis made by the extension itself so it's this is all being performed in JavaScript um, so outside of the Saxon JS environment but also once we run uh, Saxon JS we may also get problems that are highlighted that Saxon JS picks up uh, so effectively there are two levels of problem reporting one is from the built-in syntax checker and the other is from Saxon JS itself so that is effectively a function that we've created we're not actually using that function yet so let's um, make an attempt to use that so let's add a an extra p element here that is just going to um, uh, effectively call this function so we can add a sequence and now we're going to call fn test and we need to pass it a st string parameter and so we're getting an error at the moment because it's expecting um, it's not finding a function with zero arguments so uh, we can actually um, now add an argument and it's got to be a string so let's just call it um, and so now we don't get a problem reported anymore so as well as it adding the color paragraph elements which have been done here actually let's remove this choose because we're, that was really just done for demo purposes um, so now we're going to get the uh, paragraph that we've added here that is making this function call to test and so let's run this so uh, shift command B isn't it and okay shift command B and we've got a transformation failure here and that's because it's saying val cannot be empty and this oh this is because I renamed this um, but that is it's expecting that to be set from our tasks.json here but that at the moment is set to val1 uh, and it should actually be val because we've renamed the parameter so let's change that back to be val um, so now if I run that again okay so that's executed correctly now um, so let's actually look at the results so that's in result.html here so that that looks good and now we've got that um, the result of that function call within that new paragraph that we're adding okay um, so while we're here we can also this function is actually in the same file as the kind of top level XSL it's all top level at the moment but let's actually um, just demonstrate creating a, a new XSLT module so let's create a new file here and we'll call this functions dot XSL and what we can do actually let's um skip that let's delete that file and I'll show you an easier way to uh, do what I was intending to do which is if you want to um, have um, kind of refactor things so that we're using a functions module style sheet then we can just um, create an import instruction and from here um, we're going to create a new uh, file which we can call functions 
Xcel. Now, at the moment, it's complaining because there is no functions file that can be inserted, and actually, it's not. Um, it's not providing any quick fixes, but what we can do is if you click on the command button, that normally allows you to go to uh, to follow the link, but that link doesn't exist. So if I click on that, it says it's unable to open functions.xsl, but it's giving me the option to create the file. So let's accept that. And so now that's created functions.xsl for us. So what I was going to do was to... Um, remove that function here and you can see now that we're getting an error because that function is no longer available in the context um, so I'm going to save that file now but within here um, oh, I've got to uh, add in yes basically I still need the uh, it still needs to be within the star sheet of course so let's create the the star sheet but remove everything apart from the the function itself uh, and we need to borrow that prefix we still need a prefix there because we're going to use we're still using that in the function call but it also needs to be included here and we can actually get rid of these uh, Declaration. So now we've got that, and that is part of the context now. So if we go back here, you can see that we're not getting an error reported because it's actually picking up the functions that are imported. And so now we're not actually seeing a problem reported for this file because it actually exists. And the other thing that you can do here is... Uh, this is about the go to definition part. So, uh, if you, you can click on go to definition, and it takes us to that function. So, that was what I wanted to demonstrate there. Uh, we've talked about Visual Studio Code tasks, bracket matching. Uh, this is effectively just where um, you highlight one bracket and you see another bracket. The the matching bracket highlighted also. It's a standard editor feature is just just to show that it does work here in the XPath context. Um, so errors and warnings are shown in problems but also uh, you get those uh, squiggly underlines uh, demonstrated how we can follow uh, includes and imports. We've got some custom editing features that are kind of uh, just generic XML so we have some snippets that are aware of where, whether you're within a, an element tag or within an attribute value, that, whether things are available. There is some basic XML well formless checking. Uh, we have tag rename, so I haven't shown you that. So if um, we wanted to rename this paragraph to be something else, like a div, then you just rename the start tag and it will rename the end tag automatically for you. Um, there's auto tag close, so that's just a question of if we w want to end that tag, you just need to type the, the forward slash for closing the tag and then it will automatically insert what the, the tag name should be for that context. Uh, We've shown the cleaning up of orphaned tags by uh, effectively inserting that forward slash to make an uh, element self-closing. So that is uh, a basic introduction to the features. Uh, there are many more parts to this extension which I hope to cover in further videos. Uh, thank you for listening.